welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 9th of June. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information by going to weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. Give us a call on the weather info line at 800-472-0391. And during the day, you can find more information about your Alaska weather on Facebook at NWS Alaska, on Twitter, NWS Alaska, NWS Anchorage, NWS Juno, or NWS Fairbanks, all using the hashtag AKWX. That'll bring you into the weather conversation around our state. And on YouTube in the afternoon, you'll get your daily afternoon map briefing. You can find it also after the show, the complete broadcast of Alaska weather, simply by going to AKWX TV in the search bar on YouTube or on our broadcast partner's website, alaskapublic.org, on the bottom right-hand side of their screen. Now, if you've noticed, across southern Alaska today, especially across south central and Portage and many of the gaps and passes across the Alaska range and the higher uh, plateaus, it's been fairly windy today, and those winds will continue through the evening and overnight hours and probably well into the morning, especially in the northern side of the Alaska Range. Now, if you're uh, planning to go through some of the passes like Windy Pass, for example, or perhaps uh, Tanita Pass, you'll probably find some stronger gusts, especially on the northern sides of those passes there. So take that into consideration if you've got flying uh, plans tomorrow. In the meantime, though, it is presenting a, a, a heightened level of fire danger across the region, at least through the rest of this evening and perhaps in some cases into tomorrow morning. So everything you see plotted on the map today is a red flag warning, a notice uh, that fire danger is a little bit higher, especially due to the wind that we're having tonight. Now, as we look across the region for fire danger across all of Alaska, you'll notice there are some brighter red spots there. Those are areas of extreme fire danger. Some of those across south central in the Matanuska and uh, Susitna Valleys, also a little bit further north into the Copper River Basin and the eastern Alaska Range, and then back into the uh, Tanana Valley and areas just south of the Yukon Valley, all looking at high to occasionally extreme fire danger. Also a little spot on the northern parts of southeast, closer to Haines and Skagway as we get into drier weather again toward the end of the week. Uh, conditions will probably increase their fire danger uh, in many other parts of the state. Now, as we look at the Bering Sea satellite picture, a couple things to note. Once again, the main storm track is generally south of Alaska at this point. We're under the influence of a very pronounced trough of low pressure that's allowing northerly winds to work into the Bering Sea. Low clouds continue to stream into the southern Bering. You're not seeing a whole lot of it here in this particular satellite picture, but when we turn over to the visible satellite picture here in just a minute, you'll notice a pretty wide swath of fog and stratus across the chain. You can see some of it here across the central and western chain. Uh, cooler weather is working down through the Bering Strait, and again, the Chukchi Sea coast is uh, likely going to see some periods of rain and snow mixed together, but most of what we're going to see over land will simply be liquid precipitation at this point. Another wave of low pressure is working off of eastern Asia. You can see that comma-shaped cloud right here, a sign of a well-organized weather system that's several days away from reaching the western Aleutians as of now. So let's look over at the visible satellite picture. And as we look down from outer space, you can see several areas of clearing across central and southern parts of southeast. But you can also see another comma-shaped cloud here. This one's, we're a little zoomed in, so it looks a little bit larger than what we were looking at just a moment ago. Here's low pressure across southwestern Alaska, another wave here across the northern Gulf, and our clearing across central and southern parts of southeast. This moisture flow is working very hard northward into the higher train of southern Alaska, squeezing out some pretty heavy rain and wind across Portage today. Heavy rain and wind reported earlier there today. We saw some stronger gusts up around 48 miles around uh, Portage and 55 miles an hour up around Big Delta earlier today. Plenty of clearing just north of the Alaska Range there, and then we get into that textured cloud cover that tells us clouds are bubbling up. Those are cumulus clouds, and in some cases, thunderstorm clouds across northern and central Yukon. And then we get into the smoother flat clouds across the central and northern Bering. Those are stratus and uh, low clouds and fog, and a lot of that seen around St. Paul and certainly the central and western Aleutian. So watch the loop one more time, and for right now, central and southern southeast, we're enjoying pretty fair weather at this point, but that will come to an end as clouds continue to stream east. We're bringing a better chance of rain for many in southeastern Alaska as we go through the latter half of the week. 
Here's a look at the weather map now. Colder air is working just to the west of the Bering Strait and dropping south, but we do have a ridge of high pressure sneaking its way northward to just about Nome. Underneath that's where we're finding the stratus, and we were seeing a few showers and thunderstorms across southwestern Alaska. Expect that to continue into the evening. And heavier rainfall across Prince William Sound. High pressure sitting just south of Haida Gwaii and the Queen Charlottes continues to bring in that warm and wet flow right across the central and eastern parts of the Gulf. Widely scattered thunderstorms were popping up across the central and western parts of northern Yukon and getting fairly close to the eastern Alcan border. As we look northward into tonight, you can expect some colder weather to interact with precipitation there. Rain and snow showers will be possible with low pressure moving in to about the central parts of the Brooks Range, maybe just west of the Dalton Highway. And it looks like colder air will also work into the west coast. Out ahead of that, a possibility of a few evening thunderstorms. Uh, to the south of that, the frontal boundary is breaking up. Uh, look for that boundary to slowly disintegrate, but the moisture and the wind and the pressure gradient will still be there. So uh, evening gusts will continue across some of those favored blustery areas that we've seen today. For most in the central and eastern interior, things may be fairly quiet, though you will see a, quite a bit of clouds, and there may still be some stronger gusts in the region. Out across the Bering, showers and thunderstorms will be limited fairly uh, east of the coastline. Out across the west, though, a fog and stratus is more expected there, with warmer air moving uh, east from Asia and slowly falling apart and mixing in over the Bering Strait and the Bering Sea's cooler waters. Low pressure very close to Arctic Village and Kaktovik will continue tracking eastward. That's going to start dragging down some colder weather. Now, there are several kind of bubbles of colder air back behind those leading edges. That's what we've got drawn on here in the blue lines. Uh, that represents the leading edge of that cold air mass as it drops southward and eastward. As it continues moving south, the Alaska Range will act as a wall, kind of holding that back for at least a little bit of time. But it will help to build up clouds and probably uh, inspire some local gusts through some of the gaps and passes there. Another wave of low pressure across the central gulf at 1,005 millibars will stir up more rain across coastal areas and push moisture into southeastern Alaska. Some of that, especially further northward toward Yakutat, could be occasionally heavy. And snow showers will be possible across the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea Coast, while stratus and relatively stable weather should be expected across the Bering. By Thursday, with a little more sunshine and a little more cooler air just to the north of the frontal boundary, showers and thunderstorms will be more likely around the Alcan and perhaps as far west as the middle Tanana Valley. Points south and west will deal more with clouds around Bethel and Bristol Bay. There might be a few showers popping up there. And a chance of rain is expected around Kodiak Island and areas on the eastern side of the Kenai Peninsula, Portage, and perhaps into eastern sections of Prince William Sound throughout the day. A trough of low pressure tracks eastward toward southeastern Alaska, and that will keep the focus for rain in place across many from the capital city and further southward toward the Dixon entrance. High pressure develops over Nome at 1,015 millibars. That may break up a few areas of cloud cover and bring back the sun, while showers should pop up across parts of the central and western Brooks Range. And high pressure strengthens just south of Adak and Atka at 1,030 millibars. Let's look at your weather maps. Here's what happened today. Back in the mid to upper 50s for most areas in southeast, a few choice places uh, popped into the 60s for a time. Hyder was one of them, all the way up to 68 degrees. Around Yakutat, periods of rain today at 49 degrees, 45 in Valdez, 47 for Seward. It was 56 degrees in Homer, 55 in Kenai. Anchorage saw 50 degrees. This is Sitna Valley. It was in the lower to mid 50s with Talkeetna at 58. 55 around Healy, 63 in Fairbanks, 67 in Eagle. They actually hit 68 degrees for a high today after starting out the morning at 30 degrees. It was both the hottest and the coldest spot uh, today in Alaska, as well as uh, Savunga dropping down to 30 degrees. Fort Yukon, 64 late this afternoon. And as you look even further northward toward the Arctic coast, we saw temps from the mid 40s to lower 50s. And then once you got to Barrow and Atkasuk, temperatures dropped into the 30s and 40s there as you got into that northerly flow. And you can see that huge difference. Warm side here and much cooler out across the northwest. Kotzebue Sound temperatures were only in the 40s today. Nome saw 45 and just a few drops southward. You see readings back in the lower to mid 50s, especially into the interior. Temperatures shot up to 57 in Bethel, 60 in McGrath, Tanana was 64, Sparavon, Lake Iliamna. Temperatures all in the lower to mid 50s today. Bristol Bay temperatures were in the lower 50s. The Alaska Peninsula saw readings in the upper 40s to mid 50s. In fact, Kodiak was 51. Both St. Paul and St. George saw highs in the lower 40s today. And central and western parts of the chain were back in the mid to upper 40s. So overall, a fairly pleasant day across the Aleutians with stable weather, but again, fairly cloudy. 
Low temperatures tonight back in the mid 40s for most of the central and eastern interior of the Arctic coast at or just above freezing. The Seward Peninsula and Kotzebue Sound in the upper 30s with southwestern Alaska back in the mid 40s. Same goes for the Alaska Peninsula and the chain. St. Paul looking at 39 degrees south central in the mid 40s and southeast closer to the mid 40s to nearly 50 degrees. High temperatures tomorrow will range from the lower to mid 50s for most of southeast with more clouds and a better chance of rain. So not as nice as it was today. South Central is expecting highs back in the mid to upper 50s. A few places might close in on 60 degrees if you don't see a whole lot of cloud cover. 56 in Kodiak. The interior is still going to be warm and any breaks in the cloud cover could help to spark a shower, maybe a storm. Across the Arctic coast, 30s and 40s, but look out around Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, out toward Kaktovik. Much warmer conditions there ahead of that cooler wave that's affecting the Chukchi Sea coast with highs only in the upper 30s tomorrow. Nome 46, southwest, and the YK looking at temps in the upper 40s to lower 50s. Norton Sound and Unalakleet, 45 degrees, about the same in St. Paul, and 40s and 50s for the chain and most of the Alaska Peninsula. Now, flying weather shows uh, MVFR conditions are pretty widespread across the west, especially following that cooler weather moving east and southeast. Out ahead of it, we have instability enough for a few showers and storms. Southeast looking at marginal conditions. Same goes for Prince William Sound. You'll probably see MVF or VFR, I should say, from the Susitna Valley southward through most of Cook Inlet and north and east out of Kodiak and maybe on the south side of the Alaska Peninsula and hit and miss across southwest. Here's your pass conditions then. Up north, Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass are both expected to see MBFR conditions through most of your Wednesday. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions through Wednesday. Same goes for Rainy Pass. And once you get a little bit further north, this is where we need to start watching out for some turbulence, especially in the northern side of these passes there. So you might have to hold on to the yoke just a little bit harder. MBFR conditions there for Windy Pass, Isabel Pass, expecting VFR conditions to develop. But again, could be some turbulence issues there in the day. And Mentasta Pass looking at VFR, but also fairly blustered. Tanita Pass, we'll see some uh, chop through the region. Tanita Pass, probably looking at MVFR conditions by late in the afternoon. Portage Pass, still looking at rainfall and marginal conditions throughout your day. And as we get down to Chilkoot and White Pass, expect MVFR through most of the day. A lot of kind of uh, intermediate levels there going on for the next uh, 24 to 36 hours. Freezing levels. Well, warm air is dropping south and east with a ridge of high pressure there. With uh, the unstable air across the Gulf, you can see there's certainly some lower levels around Kodiak and around the Wrangell St. Elias and just east of Prince William Sound. And here's that big cold following those cold fronts dropping into the north and west in the uh, Norton Sound region with levels as low as 2, 4, and even 6,000 feet. Icing potential is generally light, isolated, moderate, above 7 to about 8,000 feet for the uh, north and western Gulf Coast, as well as parts of southeast, above 6,000 feet north and west of the Alaska Range, and above 2,000 feet uh, for the north and western plains around the Chukchi Sea Coast, and from about uh, Kotzebue and Kivalina eastward. As we look at the jet stream, the main pattern that we're seeing on the satellite picture is confirmed by the jet stream forecast tomorrow, generally across the north and central Pacific. Uh, you can see wind speeds there as strong as 115 knots, really focusing in on the Pacific Northwest. And that makes room for low pressure in the Gulf to drag in cooler weather coming off of eastern Asia. And we actually have a southerly flow leaving Alaska, heading north toward the pole at about 50 to 60 knots. At 9,000 feet, you can see low pressure and that trough slowly swinging eastward. That's allowing that cooler and drier air to come in from the north and west and for a ridge to build out across the North Pacific. Wind speeds under that are fairly light, about 15 to 20 knots or so. Wind speeds across St. Lawrence Island closer to 35 knots, and you see some of those faster winds actually making their way into the middle Yukon Valley. For southeast, wind speeds are ranging from about 25 to 55 knots coming in from the south. Uh, and you'll notice lighter wind speeds closer to the Alcan border. At 3,000 feet, we see a similar northwesterly flow coming in across the central and western parts of the Bering and the Bering Strait. The Chukchi Sea Coast looking at 20 knots. Fairly light winds under high pressure here, 15 to 25 knots at most. They really slow down over the eastern chain. And southerlies are a little bit stronger again at this point. For southeastern Alaska, 15 to about 40 knots. So turbulence potential absolutely across the eastern Alaska range, below 6,000 feet. Might even be some occasional moderate here. Just uh, be very careful and check conditions before you go. Look for uh, some light chop across the southern Bering Sea and below 6,000 feet across St. Lawrence Island. Otherwise hit and miss throughout the gaps and passes, especially in the southern third of Alaska. That's a look at your aviation weather. I'll be back in just a few minutes with the rest of your marine weather forecast. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm 
Craig Goodrich, Fire Marshal for the State of Alaska. I'd like to talk to you before we get started with the upcoming video to tell you that conditions are extremely dry right now in the state. There have been a number of forest fires so far. We want to avoid another disastrous year like we had in 1996 at the Miller's Reach fire. The video that is upcoming will have a variety of useful information, simple points that you can employ to help defend your home from the devastating effects of wildland forest fire. If at the end of this video you have questions, please feel free to contact your local fire department or the office of the state fire marshal. I'm Jim Smalley of the National Fire Protection Association. As a homeowner living in areas where wildfires can occur, you can protect your home and preserve the environment around you by taking a few simple precautions. First, before you buy land for a home, check with local officials to see what fire protection is available. Keep in mind that some areas are less naturally fire safe than others. For instance, during a fire, narrow canyons become natural chimneys drawing in fire and accelerating its rate of spread. Locate your home on the most level portion. Fire spreads rapidly, even on minor slopes. If you're building a home on top of a ridge, it's also very important to build an adequate setback, at least 30 feet for a single-story home, to prevent the house from being hit directly by flames and heat moving up the sides of the ridge. Pre-construction planning shouldn't stop with the home itself. Consider that in the event of fire, firefighters need to be able to get to your site. You will need two-way roads with parking lanes to allow fire trucks and emergency vehicles plenty of room to get in and out. And since these vehicles may have difficulty climbing steep roads, build your road with a gradient of less than 12%. Any bridges leading to your home should also be wide enough and strong enough to support firefighting vehicles. A 40,000-pound minimum is recommended but check with fire officials about local requirements. If your site has a cul-de-sac, make sure the radius is a minimum of 45 feet, wide enough for a fire truck to turn around without having to back up. A loop or U-shaped driveway provides plenty of access for firefighting equipment and an alternate escape route for you. Be sure to mark your location with a road name and house number clearly visible from the road so firefighters can find you. Whether you're building a new home or retrofitting an existing one, you can work with building contractors, your architect, and fire protection agencies to create a design that's both aesthetically pleasing and fire safe. There are many people in there that have bits and pieces of information that uh, individually need to be brought together and uh, produce a sort of an umbrella of information that would be available to the design professions. And that's not just architects, that's planners and uh, landscape architects. I think that, that many landscape architects as well as other design professionals are not aware of all of the uh, do's and don'ts of protecting uh, structures in life within the urban wildland interface. The best thing is cooperation from the start. You know, it's uh, iron out uh, uh, the problem areas, try to work out the problem areas, identify them, and then uh, you know, work out solutions to those problems as soon as possible. What we asked the developer to do was present a variety of opportunities that could be exploited through the project master plan that would be adopted through our process. The applicant came back with those uh, suggestions. He, of course, consulted with the fire protection districts. There are lots of situations in this particular part of the country where people have uh, built into subdivisions that really didn't have adequate planning from a fire point of view. 
And so we have areas that we're very concerned about putting firemen into the area to save the houses. And we really feel that if we do have a fire in, in some particular areas, that we may just have to let the house go because it, w it would be a suicide mission to put our firemen in there to protect the houses. These are houses that don't have an adequate water system. They have long, narrow driveways. They have uh, less than 30 feet clearance around the structure. They have uh, shake roofs, root sides. Uh, they have big bay windows with uh, nice trees growing up through the decks. And as far as we're concerned, these are areas that we're actually going to have to write off. We will not be able to save these houses. Fire officials say that non-treated wood shake roofs, which catch wind-blown sparks, are the number one cause of home losses in wildland areas. So your roof should be made of non-combustible or fire-resistant materials. Some jurisdictions may allow the use of factory-treated wood shakes, but you should check this with your local authorities. You may think that roof sprinklers could prevent a wood shake roof from burning, but they could provide only a false sense of security. In the event of fire, you would need large volumes of water to really make the roof safe, and water pressure is generally at its lowest during a fire. The electricity needed to pump the water may also fail during a fire crisis. Also, the high winds which often accompany wildland fires can divert the sprinkler spray from the roof. Like the roof, Exterior walls should be made of fire-resistive materials from the ground to the roof line. It also helps immensely to keep flammable vegetation, wood piles, and debris away from the walls. But we'll talk more about that later. To ensure that you don't create your own spark hazard, screen your chimneys with non-combustible wire mesh screening. Also, cover your exterior attic and underfloor vents with wire mesh no larger than one half inch to prevent sparks from being drawn in and catching fire. Sparks can melt through plastic or nylon screening. And if you're building a new home, locate your under eave vents near the roof line rather than near the wall to prevent heat or flames from being entrapped. For the same reason, the eaves themselves should be boxed or designed with minimal overhang. You should also screen under your porch or any other areas below the ground line, again, to keep out sparks and flames. Where windows are concerned, thick, tempered safety glass is the safest choice, especially for picture windows and sliding glass doors. It may be possible to use double pane glass instead, but you should contact your local fire officials to see what's appropriate. Again, if you're building a new home, minimize the size and number of windows on the side of the house that would likely be exposed to a fire, the downhill side, or both. Also, windows should not face trees or shrubs that are closer than 30 feet away. On the outside, protect windows and sliding glass doors with non-flammable shutters, balconies, or decks. Fire-resistant drapes add extra protection inside. Okay, now time for a quick check of your ice edge across the Chukchi Seacoast. You can see area opening up even more today across uh, areas just north and west of Point Lay and west of Point Hope, north of Shishma. An awful lot of open water there, so continue to watch for more changes. You can always get your latest update and forecast from weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice.php. An interactive map link awaits you at the top of that screen. Click that link and you can see all the color colored uh, patchwork areas across the Arctic there that'll tell you a little bit more about the level of ice and how thick that is and perhaps where it's moving. Across southeastern Alaska, winds will run around 15 to 25 knots across the inner waterways tomorrow, 3 to 5 foot seas on the inside, and you're looking at 7 to 8 foot seas all the way up to 9 foot seas as you head out toward Yakutat. A southerly flow there reaching up to 20 knots west of Gustavus and out across Sound and out toward Yak Yakutat and Icy Bay, again from the south. As you get into Wednesday, a little bit more of a westerly push as that disturbance travels eastward, and that will focus a little more rain across the inner waterways there. A south and southeasterly flow reaching as strong as 25 knots in the north around the Lynn Canal with 5-foot seas, 3-foot seas around the Clarence Strait, and an onshore flow coming into Craig and Klawak from the south and west, about 15 knots with a 10-foot sea there on Thursday. Across south central, you're looking at easterlies in Prince William Sound up to 15 knots with a 3-foot sea. South and easterly flow across the north and western Gulf of Alaska. Seas ranging from 8 to 11 feet. North and northeasterly winds coming down Cook Inlet and west of the Barrens from 15 to 20 knots. And more of a light and variable flow inside of Shelikoff Strait, but on the other side of Kodiak Island. Wind speeds up to 25 knots there with a 13-foot sea. Those become a little more westerly with time on Thursday. A light and variable flow in the north and western Gulf. Seas still holding around 6 feet. Two-foot seas on the inside of Prince William Sound, and the weather conditions improve there. A south and westerly flow coming up Cook Inlet. 20 knots there with a 5- to 6-foot sea west of the Barrens. That's a little more westerly and southwesterly inside of Shelikoff Strait. 
across the Alaska Peninsula and inside Bristol Bay, you're looking at 20 to 25 knots with 6 to 7 foot seas on the north side, a northwesterly flow on the south side with 12 to 15 foot seas for Wednesday, becoming westerly with time on Thursday, 20 knots all areas, 6 to 7 foot seas across the Bering Sea coast and 8 foot seas across the Pacific coast for your Thursday. For the Aleutians, you're looking at a broad westerly flow sweeping across from Nikolsky all the way out to Shemya, 15 to 25 knots in all areas with 7 foot seas on the Bering Sea coast and 7 to 8 foot seas across the Pacific. The seas come up just a little bit more east of Nikolsky to Unalaska with 9 foot seas expected there on a northwesterly wind at 20 knots and southwesterly north of Unalaska. By Thursday, very little change, uh, generally a westerly flow for all areas, 15 to 25 knots at the worst, 5 to 6, even 7 foot seas across the Pacific, 6 foot seas in the Bering Sea coast, and you'll notice a little bit more of a southerly shift here. That's that next weather maker coming in from the North Pacific, uh, getting a little bit uh, just north and west of Shemya. And as it does so, you're still going to be on the warmer southerly side of that. So winds will start to come up from the south as we go into Thursday. Across the west coast, north and westerly winds coming down the coastline itself. 20 knots with 4-foot seas there. Northerlies around the St. Matthew Island waters. For the Pribilovs, a westerly flow at 25 knots with an 8-foot sea. And as you go into Thursday, winds start to change around to more of a south and westerly flow. Again, responding to the storm a little bit further south of the west coast. Westerly is outside of Kuskokwim Bay, 20 knots west of St. Paul and St. George with a 7-foot sea expected for Thursday. Now for the Arctic coast, southeasterlies stay up a little bit across the Beaufort Sea coast, 20 knots there. Otherwise, north and westerly winds coming down the Chukchi Sea coast, 10 to 15 knots with a little bit of a stronger flow inside of Kotzebue Sound with a 4-foot sea on Wednesday. By Thursday, you're looking at a weak westerly flow coming across Barrow and Wainwright, a south and westerly wind coming up the Chukchi Sea coast, 15 knots with 2 to 3-foot seas there. And winds are still up around the Beaufort Sea coast, 20 to 25 knots, but the wind direction shifts to more of a north and westerly flow. Now, recapping tonight's weather, low pressure sits across Bristol Bay and will continue working into the western gulf. That drops to about 998 millibars, and a front moves into the northern and eastern coast, spreading rainfall a little bit more into the central and northern parts of southeast. A chance of showers and light rain continues for the Prince William Sound and northern gulf coast. A few thunderstorms are possible across southwestern Alaska ahead of a cooler surge of Air there and showers and thunderstorms likely stay across most of the central and western parts of Yukon with low pressure moving in across the north slope at 991 millibars that will travel eastward as we go into Wednesday and as it does so expect those uh, showers to spread eastward as well and cooler air will drop southward across the western coast. Watch for showers to continue across the north maybe mixing with snow at times and warmer westerly winds start to blow into the southwestern coast by Thursday. Thanks for watching Alaska. Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.